Hello YouTubers out there, this is Jerry Sadovia at the Movies. I want to make a correction from my 1983 theatrical films that I saw in theaters. Apparently the Gene Hackman film Misunderstood was released in 1984, in March of 84, not in 83. So I saw it in 84. Uh, oh well. You can't blame me for trying to remember the exact <laughs> ear for a film that I kind of forgotten all about. Until I saw the poster for it uh, recently while trying to navigate films that I had seen in theaters at that time. So let's move on here to the films of 1984, theatrical films that I saw in theaters in 1984. The Terminator. Uh, of course, this is the original Terminator with Arnold Schwarzenegger, the one and only Sarah Connor, played by Linda Hamilton. My father took me to see this uh, movie, and I didn't know what to expect, but it certainly... Of all the films on this list, The Terminator was probably the most influential. It was way ahead of its time, I think. And I think it was a it was a, a mild box office hit, but it gained a lot of traction throughout the years. So again, this is we're talking 1984. Several sequels have come since. The best one is Terminator 2 Judgment Day, which was released in the summer of 1991. This is also the first James Cameron film that I saw. So there you have it, The Terminator. That was exciting to see that in theaters. Uh, it was, it had a unique feel to it. It was sort of low rent, cyber, I guess you could say almost cyber punk, but not exactly. It definitely was an unusual time travel type flick, uh, for sure. All right, let's move on to Supergirl. This of course had Helen Slater as Supergirl. And I saw this with my friend Chris, and I think my friend Chris hated the movie. I sort of enjoyed it. I've seen it a couple of times since then. You know, it's fine. It's nothing terrific. It's not as good as Christopher Reeve's Superman films. And I don't think it's as good as what I'd seen, which is only the first season of uh, Supergirl that came out on, uh, was shown on television on the, was it the CW, I think, a few years back. So... Helen Slater was well cast, you know, it, it is what it is, it's nothing great, it's cheesy, alright, you know, <laughs> probably seeing it once is more than enough. Alright, Star Trek 3, The Search for Spock, my father took me to see this one, this was a good movie, uh, definitely a good movie, the best in the series is probably Star Trek 2, The Search, f uh, or I'm sorry, The Search, <laughs> The Wrath of Khan, which I saw several times back in 1982, but this movie is quite good. This one in Star Trek Four, and then you know after that I don't I, I can't say I'm much of a Trekkie, but uh, I enjoyed Star Trek Three a lot, and you know it's a great cast. And spoiler alert: you don't see Spock till the very end, uh, since he's resurrected because he's in his coffin. I guess you could say sarcophagus is in the planet Genesis, where everything comes back to life. So. Um, Yes, I'd like to see it again someday. I, I I do have it on DVD, and I haven't really quite gotten around to it, but I will. So, good movie. Starman is probably the most unusual John Carpenter movie that John Carpenter ever directed. It's a love story. It deals with uh, Jeff Bridges as this alien who comes to Earth and happens to break into Karen Allen's house, and she lost her husband... I think a few years past or whatever it was, and looks remarkably like uh, Jeff Bridges. And this alien shapeshifts himself into Jeff Bridges. And it's that type of movie. It's sort of a chase film, but it's more dramatic, more melancholy, and uh, very romantic. And, you know, it's got Karen Allen. You can't... Karen Allen's made some bad movies, but uh, this was one of her best ones, for sure. Starman. So, yes, this was also the first John Carpenter film I think I saw in theaters. I didn't see The Thing or Halloween in theaters. I've seen them, of course, but uh, or Christine. But, um, yes, Starman. Runaway is Tom Selleck. And, you know, he's come a long way since that movie. It's a cheesy movie. It's, I guess, sort of entertaining. I don't know really how else to distinguish it. I think it, it had to do with Gene Simmons as a villain who has these tiny robotic devices that kill people and he wields them with a remote control or something i don't know yeah cynthia rose is in this movie when i looked at the poster i remember the poster very well and the movie to some degree 
I, I kind of forgotten Cynthia Rhodes was even in it. I don't think I've ever seen Cynthia Rhodes in anything else since then. Um, yeah, that same year, Tom Selleck also did the film Lassiter, which was a throwback to a 1930s type movie. Uh, Tom Selleck has always been old fashioned, you know, so, uh, yeah, it was all right, I guess. I saw it with my friend Chris. I, I can't say we loved it, but it was fine. Uh, <laughs> that's all I could say about that. The Razor's Edge. Now, that's a movie that I would like to see again someday. It's uh, Bill Murray's first serious role. It's a remake of a Tyrone Power film, also called The Razor's Edge. And it it was uh, it was very well acted. I, I would just have to see it again. I, I, don't, I can't say much more than that at this point. Let's move on to A Passage to India. Now, this was the first and only David Lean film I've seen in theaters. Shocker. I wish I'd seen Lawrence of Arabia in theaters. I never got around to that. Um, you know, it's funny how certain films like Lawrence of Arabia didn't really end up in the suburbs when I lived there. So you had to go to New York City to go see big epic pictures like, you know, The Last Emperor by Bernardo Bertolucci and that sort of thing. A Passage to India is good. It's not a great David Lean film, but it's good. Uh, it's got Al Guinness, uh, Judy Davis. I think the story had something to do with uh, a probable rape that occurred in a cave and the politics surrounding that, something of that nature. It's been a while since I've seen it. So, Never Ending Story. This one I saw twice in theaters. I took my brother to see it, and I enjoy the hell out of it. Never Ending Story is a lot of fun. It has its dark moments. It's about a kid reading a book, and somehow the book overtakes him. He he not only imagines this world, he's actually in this world, this fairy tale, uh, fairy tale world. And there's that flying dog who's supposed to be a dragon. That might be the only thing, really, that's a bit doesn't quite work. But uh, nevertheless definitely worth seeing um never ending story and I, i'm glad i saw it twice it, it's a really good film wolfgang peterson who prior to that film did das boot also known as the boat so uh he's been an unusual kind of director he's done different things all right the natural is one of my favorite baseball films i saw that twice in theaters uh keep in mind in those days the matinee to go see a movie and we're speaking of 1984 now was two bucks so definitely affordable <laughs> uh and i love it uh, robert redford it kind of made me into a robert redford fan the natural because i hadn't seen a whole lot of robert redford films prior to the natural except for maybe butch cassidy and the sundance kid so that it was a terrific movie uh, great film glenn close kim basinger just great film terrific movie can't say enough about it all right so now we move on to the Muppets Take Manhattan. This is a sequel that I really didn't care for. I found it boring. I don't know how I would react to it today. I would have to see it again. Um, I took my brother to see that. So, you know, because my brother that summer had to go see something that was not dark and too violent, like Indiana Jones or Gremlins. So Muppets Take Manhattan was the alternative. But uh, I've kind of forgotten that movie. I, I don't even know what it's about. I just remember I was bored by it. Sorry, Muppet fans. All right. Mickey and Maud, Dudley Moore. This was a terrific comedy. I saw it with my friend Chris. Again, he didn't really care for it that much, but he did laugh out loud at a few scenes. It's one of those comedies that uh, is more dramatic, but it has a lot of comedic elements. It was maybe too grown up a movie for us to see at that time. You know, we're both thir we were both 13, so, you know, we weren't really the target audience, but... It is a very funny film. Blake Edwards directed it. It's got Amy Irving. Uh, just all around terrific movie. Uh, I've seen it again since, several times on cable, and then I saw it uh, a number of years ago. And I was surprised just how leisurely paced it is. It's not really a rip-roaring Blake Edwards type movie like some of his other ones, like Pig Panther or whatever, but... Uh, Still, definitely worth seeing, but it was maybe too adult for us, but I definitely liked it a lot. All right, The Karate Kid, I also saw with my friend Chris. Uh, yeah, I love The Karate Kid. <laughs> it's just terrific. Pat Morita, Ralph Macchio, you know what the deal is. A lot of fun. Glad I saw it in theaters. Rousing finish. Everybody in the audience. It's an audience movie, for sure. So, yes. 
Karate Kid. All right, now into something that, of course, I've talked about endlessly on this channel, and that's Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. This was the first major summer movie, opened on Memorial Day weekend, and the most controversial movie of that year, uh, aside from Gremlins, which we'll get to in a minute, and because it was just too, too much. This, was, this should have been the PG-13 movie, but of course, PG-13 didn't exist yet. Right, uh, sorry, <laughs> Temple of Doom and Gremlins uh, kind of lended uh, credence to developing a rating somewhere between PG and R. And uh, yes, this, this film upset my father very much because, of course, he took my brother to see it along with uh, myself. My brother at the time was only three. <laughs> So I, I think he actually was, he was able to deal with some of it, but it's too gruesome for, for little kids. It's too much. I mean, when a heart's pulled out of a chest, you know, it's, uh, you're crossing the line there. Really upset parents that year. And I remember the theater, kids were screaming, 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 screaming. I don't think I've ever seen a movie aside from Wizard of Oz where kids were screaming like there was no tomorrow. I mean, a lot of them, I think, had to be pulled out of the theater. It was just too much. All right, Iceman. Uh, this is a picture with uh, Timothy Hutton and Lindsay Krauss, I believe. John Lone plays this uh, prehistoric man who's discovered in a block of ice uh, many, many, many millions of years later. And he is uh, thought out and he is actually alive and kind of learns about uh, where humanity has been trying to communicate and so on. Very good movie at the time. I haven't really seen it again since. I, I should. Um, kind of almost forgot about it for a long time, but uh, I, I know it was definitely a good movie. So I don't think it was a great film, but it was certainly good and uh, great photography and really good performances. It's one of the few by uh, Timothy Hutton that, you know, is a good it's a good movie. He did a lot of B movies kind of and C movies and D movies <laughs> ever since Ordinary People, but Iceman was a good film. All right, Greystoke, The Legend of Tarzan, Lord of the Apes. What a title. That's directed by Hugh Hudson, who of course did uh, Chariots of Fire, which won Best Picture of 1981. Uh, Greystoke is a tremendous film, I think. It's wonderfully entertaining. Uh, it's got Christopher Lambert as Tarzan. It's got some very exciting jungle sequences. The movie then shifts to a more dramatic end where he is trying to matriculate himself back into society, but you know, he's a wild animal, this Tarzan, and really belongs in the jungle. So it's not quite the Johnny Weissmuller type stuff, but it's probably closer to the books than any of the Johnny Weissmuller uh, films of the, of the past or any other Tarzan films. Um, I, I liked it a lot. I liked its approach. It was just different. And uh, yeah, I haven't, again, really seen it since. It's got one of Sir Ralph Richardson's last performances. It was definitely, uh, it was definitely a good picture. All right, now we move on to Gremlins. Now, this is the second movie of that summer, along with Temple of Doom, that caused quite some controversy. It's got some graphic violence. And, you know, I, I, this is not really a movie for kids. It's a wickedly fun movie, but it's not really for kids. Not for little kids, anyway. As much as they try to sell it with the idea of Gizmo being this cute little, well, gremlin, <laughs> who doesn't turn nasty and uh, after you feed it food after midnight, uh, it still was a, a bit much for, for most uh, people at that time. You know, when the gremlins start their assault on the family, uh, Billy's family in the film played by uh, Zach Galligan, um, <clears throat> you know, stabbing one to, to death and then throwing it in a pot of uh, boiling water. And then the other one, I think, was exploded in a microwave. You know, it's uh, tough stuff, <laughs> not for all ages. But along with Temple of Doom, that led to the invention of the uh, PG-13 rating. One final note is uh, the first film to be rated PG-13 was actually The Flamingo Kid. But the first film to actually be released with that rating uh, that same year, 1984, was Red Dawn which I didn't see in theaters. I saw it on video, but I never cared for Red Dawn. So, uh, you know, again, these are theatrical releases. But I always enjoyed Gremlins. I think it's, it's you know, nasty fun, 
but uh, a little ahead of its time. Now it would be appreciated much more so than it was back then, I think, in terms of the violence. Nobody cares as much about the violence nowadays as they did back then. Particularly in a movie that was wrongly aimed at kids, uh, you know, eight, year, eight years old or younger, almost like an E.T. ripoff, which, of course, it's not or not even close to being anything aligned with E.T. All right. Ghostbusters. This was one I saw twice in theaters. I, I love Ghostbusters. The first Ghostbusters is great. It's just a great comedy with some scary moments. It's really effective. Bill Murray, Dan Aykroyd, you know the deal, Sigourney Weaver, Harold Ramis, Ernie Hudson, <laughs> very quotable movie. You know, what more can you say about Ghostbusters? Uh, but I did see it twice and it's definite audience picture. I think that that movie would still work today with audiences in theaters. If it were to be re-released, I think it would do well. Uh, it's that good. All right, moving on to Firstborn. Uh, this is a movie with uh, Christopher Collette, who we haven't seen much of. He was in films like The Manhattan Project, with which I, I love. And I think he did a couple of TV movies. One was called Right to Kill. This movie has Peter Weller as this kind of a, a slouch. He's uh, just not a good guy who marries uh, or, or plans to marry, I think, Terry Garr, moves into the house. And Christopher Collette is... Terry Gar's son, and she, you know, there's a scene, I think, where they do cocaine, and Christopher Collette spots them, you know, <laughs> then there's some business about hiding the cocaine, and then he, Peter Weller comes for him, it becomes a chase movie, so any, any uh, notions there of a personal drama about physical abuse, in particular, uh, is lost, whereas Peter Weller, who was in the film Shoot the Moon, with, also with Karen Allen and Albert Finney from two years earlier. That's a strong picture about a serious film about that kind of, uh, of physical abuse uh, or child abuse. But uh, Firstborn is just comical. But it does have Robert Downey Jr. in one of his first roles and Sarah Jessica Parker. But beyond that, not worth seeing. And I kind of resent it to this day that I even saw that in theaters. Not a bad movie. But just wrong-headed, foolish, foolish filmmaking. All right. Electric Dreams. Now, this one is a weird one. I had seen it, and I remember very much Virginia Madsen being in it. And it has to do with a computer that this, uh, this guy has that develops a romantic relationship with him and gets jealous if there's a... I mean, it's, it's a strange movie. I mean, not an actual physical relationship with the computer but you know what I mean the computer gets jealous and writes music or helps to write music I guess the guy is a composer I don't even remember the name of the actor who was in it the male actor but I do remember Virginia Madsen um, I don't know if I'll ever revisit this movie I think it was good enough but uh, you know who knows so we'll leave that one aside for now Dune is David Lynch's Dune and uh, I always thought that everybody hated this movie. I'm not one of those people that believes that we all have to agree on the same thing. But Dune was seen as a joke in 1984, and I thought it was continue to continue to be seen as a joke ever since. But it turns out there are admirers of Dune, including I remember my college film professor when I went to University of the Arts in Philadelphia. And he said there are many sequences in it that are really quite stunning and so, okay, he was looking at it more from a filmmaking standpoint. I don't know if it was a well-made movie. To be honest with you, I think a lot of it just looked obvious to me. The Sandworms were, you know, it's a dull movie. And I went to see that with my friend Chris. He threw popcorn at the screen. And at one point, some of the popcorn stuck on the screen. Uh, <laughs> it was, it's a popcorn-throwing movie, but it has its admirers now. So I don't know. You know, time... Time changes certain movies. You never know why people admire them or like them, but there it is, Dune. It somehow has its admirers. David Lynch has done better since, and uh, but I've heard that David Lynch seems to want to revisit that world. And I don't know if it means going back into that movie and re-editing it. I doubt that's going to happen, but uh, 
I think David Lynch should move on to other things and forget Dune, but that's just my opinion. All right. The sequence with Sting during a knife fight was, that was electrifying. The rest of the movie, no. So there you go. Conan the Destroyer. This was a bad sequel. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger is back as Conan the Barbarian. I know in my 1983 list of films I saw that I mentioned Hercules being very inferior to the Conan the Barbarian. Well, Conan the Destroyer is still better than Hercules because it's better made. But uh, you know, aside from a couple of good moments with Grace Jones, the rest of that movie is just awful. And speaking of wokeness, it's interesting that Conan the Barbarian, uh, the Destroyer rather, has Arnold Schwarzenegger, Grace Jones, and Will Chamberlain. So I guess it was a little bit ahead of its time because nobody cared whether something was woke in those days or not. So another one to consider for millennials who are listening to this uh, program, this particular video. Okay, moving on to Beverly Hills Cop with Eddie Murphy. Now this one is one of my favorite Eddie Murphy movies. I always found it endlessly quotable, most of it. And Eddie Murphy, Judge Reinhold, you know the whole deal. And I remember I really liked the film a lot. I was a little put off by some of the violence towards the end, which I think correctly it was assumed by uh, Roger Ebert that it seemed like a, the ending of Scarface with uh, Al Pacino. But in hindsight, though, most of it works very well. It was a very unique blend of comedy and thriller. And it did it very well. It could have been maybe more more satire poked at the posh <laughs> population of Beverly Hills and Eddie Murphy sort of mocking them. But uh, either way, it, it worked very well. Now, what's interesting about this movie, though, it was released not in the summer, but in December of 1984. And it was considered one of the biggest hits of 1984. But, you know, the box office revenue for the movie really didn't start till December. And so that bled into the following year, 1985. So I don't see... That's a curious thing to say it's one of the biggest hits of the of 84, when in fact made probably most of its money in 85. But nevertheless, it's cemented the status of Eddie Murphy as a leading man, for sure. Prior to that, you know, he was in supporting roles, really, if you think about it, aside maybe from 48 hours, but there was trading places. And, uh, you know, we try to forget Best Defense, which I saw on cable many years later. Again, we're talking about films I saw in theaters. So thank God I didn't see Best Defense in theaters. <laughs> All right. Moving on now to Amadeus. This was a film that won Best Picture of 1984. And I would say deservedly so. It's a great movie. I saw it. I think I went to see it twice in theaters. And I always uh, loved uh, Amadeus. Tom Hulse, of course, plays Mozart. It's very well, uh, a very good recreation of that era. Um, uh, you know, there isn't enough good things really to say about Amadeus, directed by Milos Forman, who later on went to do uh, The People vs. Larry Flint and Man on the Moon. And yeah, just a terrific, terrific movie. I. Uh, again, the music, everything, just all the performances are, are fantastic. It's just a, a very good film overall. And I'm glad I saw that one in theaters. Okay, now we move on to another comedy, All of Me, with Steve Martin. This one, I, I liked All of Me. I don't think it's a great Steve Martin movie, but it's a good one. It's got too many funny moments in it overall even if it's maybe six tenths of it that's really hilarious and the other is just mildly funny, but it made me into a Steve Martin fan. I started to really respect Steve Martin much more so after that movie. And then later on, I think I, I finally saw The Man with Two Brains and uh, Pennies from Heaven, some of his earlier work, but he really became much more of an actor uh, in even in some serious roles here and there, but he brought so much more, so much, so, so much. Uh, he brought pathos to his characters, so it wasn't always the wild and wacky Steve Martin, and he didn't always play it for sentiment. You know, Robin Williams sometimes has been guilty of that, and other comedians, including Jim Carrey, but Steve Martin maintained uh, keeping things more or less just you know empathetic. 
but trying to make us feel the way he does, uh, his characters do. And in particular, in a film like uh, The Lonely Guy, which I always liked. So, uh, All of Me, yes, Lily Tomlin, of course. It's it's a funny movie, and Lily Tomlin, basically, the basic story is that her spirit enters Steve Martin after she dies. So he starts moving about and gyrating. <laughs> he takes it all the way, Steve Martin, with that performance. I mean, it is a, a classic. So the performance overall probably is even better than the movie itself. But uh, definitely worth seeing. All right, now we move on to a film my father took me to see, 2010. The year we make contact. This is a sequel to Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. And both of them are books written by Arthur C. Clarke. Arthur C. Clarke, I think, also wrote a, another sequel called 2061, which never became a movie. This one was good, uh, but, you know, it's got Roy Scheider, who, you know, again, I've mentioned before in uh, my 1983 list. I always like Roy Scheider. Roy Scheider, I mean, if Roy Scheider's in a movie, I, I you know, well, unfortunately, he's not around anymore. But when he was in movies, he made it interesting. He had a charisma that I think he was largely an unsung actor. Kind of like Jeff Bridges for a long time. 2010 also has, um, oh goodness, <clears throat> well, can't think of his name now, the one that played Dave, uh, the ast uh, the astronaut, in uh, 2001 Space Odyssey, uh, Cur Delay. There you go. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I believe Helen Mirren is also in the movie. And uh, it's, you know, it's good. It's a good film overall. It's uh, directed by Peter Hyams, who did Capricorn 1 and Outland. So, but it explains, I think, a little too much the mystery surrounding 2001 A Space Odyssey, which was meant to be somewhat mysterious. And it's, you know, it. I wish it didn't explain things. And after a while, when Kurt DeLay keeps saying, you know, something wonderful is about to happen. And Roy Scheider says, what? Something wonderful. After a while, that gets a little tired. But uh, overall, good movie. I wish, I'm glad I saw it in theaters. It's got some uh, tense moments in it. Uh, overall, a, a good film. Um, I think that's it for this list. That's that's. These are all the films I saw in 1984. And interesting year. Some... I've seen many other films that that year, or uh, from that year, that I haven't, uh, that I didn't see in theaters. One of the more unusual ones, I guess you could say, was the fact that Breakin, which is the first official breakdancing movie, was re not only released that year, but also its sequel, which was uh, shot in tandem, I believe, with the original Breakin called Breakin to Electric Boogaloo. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, not good movies, but it's sort of fun just to pass the time. Uh, but I've seen a lot of other films, Romancing the Stone, so on and so forth, but many of these I didn't really see till much later, including Red Dawn and uh, The Flamingo Kid and so on. But uh, as far as theatrical experiences, these are the films. And once again, based on my earlier correction of 1983 flick, that was 84 actually, Misunderstood. So uh, I misunderstood myself over a movie that I <laughs> wish to forget, but that's okay. We all make mistakes. I'm amazed that I remember most of these. Um, there may be, again, some other ones I'm not thinking of. I, I don't remember. You know, I, I look these up, the, the list, and I try to look at DVDs that I have. And I recognize that many 1984 flicks I had seen much later and not necessarily in theaters. Another one would be Alphabet City with Vincent Spano. And again, another movie I'm very glad I didn't see in theaters. And, you know, of course, there were also teen comedies, but I didn't, you know, the sex comedies, I didn't see many of those in theaters, like uh, Where the Boys Are, for example, which is a remake. Um, yeah, so I'm sure there are many others. They're just not coming to mind right now. But I think th this is really the majority of what I'd seen that year in theaters. So that's it. This is 1984. Theatrical releases seen in theaters. Um, that's all i got to say about that. If you enjoy what you hear, please like and subscribe. And I'll return with, I think, a 1985 video probably next week because this gets to be a little <laughs> overwhelming after a while just thinking about all these movies and what I thought of them. But certainly next week I'll, I'll be continuing to do more of these for sure. 
and discussing them and uh, what, in some cases, what I remember from the theatrical experience itself. That's all i got to say about that, and this is Jerry Sadovi at the Movies, signing off.